Thanks, Des. Uh, good afternoon, uh, distinguished guests, uh, Rhea McGoldrick and uh, Vice Admiral Jones. Uh, thanks for having me along today. Um, I think uh, Head of Navy Capability, Rear Admiral uh, Mead, was asked to do a presentation uh, on uh, the future, I suppose, of uh, littoral warfare from a capability perspective. Um, he's currently in Oxford with his cravat and his pocket handkerchief uh, on a development course, but that didn't go over the web, did it? No. Um, so uh, I suppose uh, this year's uh, Goldrick Seminar's theme, uh, Maritime Operations Littoral, is, uh, is, as the Minister said, particularly timely, um, given the White Paper's uh, focus on a lot of these sort of capabilities. Um, before I start, uh, I'd like to thank uh, Commander Bob Moyce, who spent a fair bit of time with me uh, pulling together today's presentation. Um, he, he tried to provide a, a bit of an academic side uh, to the presentation, rather than me uh, rattling off just a repeat of the white paper. So I'd like to acknowledge his um, help. Also to Cameron Stewart, I've now realised why the last 12 months have been painful. I've got the wrong title, DG Littoral. Perhaps I should call myself DG Amphib, um, and then I might understand what I'm talking about. Um, before I get into talking about some of the future, I just want to put in a little bit of context around what's happened in Navy from a capability management perspective recently. Um, I suppose under the head of Navy capability, uh, Admiral John Mead, um, we've established a number of one-star branch heads um, as program managers, and the aim is to bring together a number of projects and products and outcomes uh, we're trying to do with capability. And there's, there's five of them. Uh, uh, Phil Spedding, Commodore Phil Spedding, who's leading the infrastructure space and the strategic planning. Uh, Peter Scott, Commodore Peter Scott, uh, leads the submarines. Commodore Rob Elliott has surface combatants, you know, the frigates, uh, the destroyers, and the aviation components. Uh, Captain Steve Dryden uh, runs the Naval Comms and Information Warfare. And myself, I have uh, the littoral programs which include amphibious uh, float support tankers and the sea lift components, mine warfare, hydrographic and oceanographic capabilities and the patrol forces. So between the five of us um, and, and HNC, we work with our fleet counterparts and uh, uh, Comsur Fleet Goddard's here today um, and Captain Mick Harris who's ComMHP and in a, what I call, you know, we use this supporting, supporting uh, relationship. Every now and again we take a Facebook photograph to prove we are working together. Um, but we're ultimately responsible for delivering this new capability life cycle brought about by the first principles review. Um, and that you know, includes the force design, those needs, requirements and risk reduction phases, acquisition phase, then obviously in service and, and disposal. And I think establishing a DG littoral position now allows the development of a program strategies and a program view across the littoral capabilities. And I, I'm working with then particularly my Army counterpart, uh, DG Modernisation Army, uh, Brigadier Chris Mills, now allows us, I think, to, in the future going forward, look strategically at a program level and across this new capabilities life cycle to deliver, deliver a better capability for government, for the Australian people, and ultimately uh, uh, for Navy. So uh, as the Minister pointed out this morning, earlier this year, the government released uh, four important documents which bear on today's subject of littoral warfare. Uh, the White Paper, the Integrated Investment Program, Defence Industry Policy, and the First Principles Review. It's important to understand that these four documents are interdependent. The change to any one has implications uh, for the others. The Integrated Investment Plan and Defence Industry Policy are about equipping the Defence Force to face the strategic challenges of the coming decades, but they are subordinate to the White Paper, which is first and foremost about strategy. The acquisition decisions in the, in the related investment program are strategy-led. In the past, it's not always been the case. The recent White Paper tells us a number of things. It tells us what our strategic defence interests and strategic defence objectives are. It creates a number of capability streams, including a new land combat and amphibious warfare stream led by the Chief of Army, where the Chief of Navy is the capability manager for a number of littoral-related programs, including amphibious combat, mine warfare, hydro hydrography and patrol capabilities, which, as I said, is part of my, which, which is my branch. The First Principles Review reshaped the department around a strategic centre based on Strategic Policy and Intelligence Group and the VCDF Group. The Strategic Centre is responsible for developing a hierarchy of documents 
linking strategic policy via concepts of operations to capability needs. This requires the capability manager to support the strategic centre and develop a mutual understanding of these linkages. This is especially true in the area of littoral warfare. My aim today is to highlight some of the challenges that the services in the strategic centre will face as we turn the government's in integrated investment program into capabilities that relate to strategy and the littoral. I'd like to expand on the earlier discussion around the definition of littoral. Traditionally, it is the area where events on land are directly affected by sea and vice versa. In the days of Marne, Colbert, the littoral was basically cannon, cannon range. Modern long-range aircraft and missiles extend that area to a point where the concept becomes boundless. For it to be useful, I believe we need to bound it to the area where operations in either environment can potentially dominate rather than merely affect the other. As Australians, we need to recognise that warfare in the littorals of a continent is not the same as warfare in the littorals of the archipelago. We live in the world's most archipelagic region, but you will be hard pressed to find any anything written by an Australian on the subject of archipelagic warfare. Perhaps today is the start of that. Historically, Western navies have tended to focus on blue water warfare and armies on continental warfare. What can we learn from countries that have a history of littoral thinking and operations? How would we fight alongside our archipelagic neighbours, both and without United States support? How should we develop our littoral capabilities? Corbett wrote more than man about the interaction between sea and land. He famously stated that, I quote, since men live upon the land and not upon the sea, great issues between nations at war have always been decided, except in the rarest cases, either by what your army can do against your enemy's territory and national life, or else by the fear of what the fleet makes it possible for your army to do. Corbett was writing as an Englishman adjacent to the European continent, and in that context, the centre of gravity will always lie on land. So what he said was true. Had he lived where we live, I think he would have recognised that the centre of gravity in archipelagic war does not necessarily lie on any single landmass. What I'm about to say is uh, most probably obvious, and that no, no one bothers to say this uh, and is forgotten, but in an archipelago, sorry, all the sea is joined together, but the land is separated. What means, sorry, that means the only option for joint manoeuvre is the sea. However, your freedom to manoeuvre at sea depends on your ability to neutralise threats from land. Understanding the independence and the relative strengths of the land and maritime power is central to how we think about fighting in the littoral and what capabilities defence, particularly Navy, should develop. In the, in the geography of our region, operations from the land can dominate the sea and vice versa. What is the best way for the services and the strategic centre to work together to ensure that we tie up the conceptual relationships in order to keep our future force aligned with strategy? Along with the first principles review, the integrated investment program is really about delivering capabilities more effectively and more efficiently to the force. It represents the largest recapitalisation of Navy since the Second World War, but less obviously we also have many non-Navy acquisitions and enablers that relate to littoral warfare. How are we going to use these new capabilities to best strategic effect? To ensure Australia maintains an ADF with the highest levels of military capability, the government is making a significant long-term investment in defence's war fighting equipment and supporting systems, research and development, and the skills and training of our defence people. A major investment will be made in modernising and enhancing the potency, range and capacity of our maritime capabilities. New investments will include the next generation of submarines, surface warships, surveillance aircraft and support vessels. Our army will have more firepower, mobility and amphibious capabilities, while soldiers will receive more lethal weapons and improved protection. Our Air Force will operate new strike reconnaissance transport aircraft with new investments focusing on better integration of their capabilities. There will be a more emphasis placed on the joint force, bringing together different land, air, sea, intelligence, electronic warfare, cyber and space capabilities so the ADF can apply more force more rapidly and more, more effectively when called on to do so. Achieving Australia's strategic defence objectives requires land forces that have the mobility, 
firepower, protection and situational awareness to deploy quickly to where they are needed, achieve their missions and return home safely. The government will make significant new investments in our land forces, including new combat vehicles, long-range fire support, and, as I said, amphibious capabilities and special forces. The biggest investment in the integrated investment program is the future submarine project. Submarines aren't necessarily comfortable operating in the littoral, but they do matter. Although today I'm focused on littoral capability, we'll usually need to cross blue water to get into the brown water. Simplistically, we'll want to keep the enemy naval forces bottled up in port or at a range from the force so they can't interfere. There is nothing more effective than the threat of a submarine. It doesn't even need to be there. They only need to think it might be. It quickly sucks up resources to counter the potential threat of a submarine. In the littoral, we don't have the same freedom of manoeuvre as in blue water combat. Littoral operations are like land operations in as such as we have to consider terrain. On land, some places are easy to move through with any sort of vehicle, others are only accessible by infantry on foot. The maritime littoral is similar, where you can go, where you can go depends on what type and size of vessel you have. In land warfare, you can be channeled, presenting the enemy with opportunities for IEDs, mines and ambushes. Similarly, in the maritime littoral, the coastal and riverine areas provides opportunity for similar tactics with our numerous fishing boats and ferries, among other enemies that can hide presenting threats and opportunities. Like the game of rock, paper, scissors, some combinations of capabilities beat others, but unlike the game, it isn't random and there are more than three options. Let us consider some of the problems we face and how they relate to the equipment we're getting. The rock, paper, scissors game analogy extends to all joint systems. How do we employ the elements of a force so that each shields the other's vulnerabilities and maximise tactical leverage? Once in the brown water, the submarine threat reduces somewhat and the enemy air, surface and shore base threats come to the fore. So although the future frigate is described as an anti-submarine ship, however, that may not be the primary role once we get into the littoral waters. We know for gunfire support or air defence of the amphibious forces required. We also need to understand that surface ships will increasingly fill the role of mother ships to families of subsystems, air, surface and subsurface, many of which are likely to be unmanned. Over the past decade, we have seen that surface combatants are vulnerable to swarming attack craft but small craft don't do well against helicopters. The S-60 Romeo is now entering service and was developed with this in mind. It has sensors and weapons optimised for de destroying small, fast craft. The 12 new offshore patrol vessels primarily, primarily will replace the Armadale class patrol boat force for the constabulary role. However, they will have the ability to embark multi-mission systems with considerable longer range and endurance than the, what the Armadales currently provide. Future iterations of the vessel will de deliver deployable mine warfare and tactical hydrographic capabilities. We need to future-proof the designs because shallow draft combatants are important in the littoral for their accessibility. The land matters to navies. From land, we or our enemies can launch a vast range of ISR and kinetic effects against a maritime opponent with a low chance of being located. Rivers can be havens for all manner of of manned and unmanned systems that could cause us grief. That is why the Army's forthcoming riverine warfare capability needs to be integrated into the maritime amphibious program. A riverine patrol capability will be re-established to increase the tactical mobility in the littoral zone. The riverine patrol capability will deliver a fleet of lightly armed boats from around the mid-2020s to allow operations in a number of different environments. The Army is also getting land-based anti-ship missiles, new landing craft and beach recovery vehicles, all of which improve our ability to control the coastline and rivers. Defence will also continue to invest in ancillary capabilities, including water watercraft and amphibious deployment and sustainment systems to keep the logistic capabilities of the Canberra-class amphibious ships at the leading edge. The air threat is a little different in the littorials. Close to shore, helicopters and unmanned systems can potentially be as dangerous as fast jets. Shaping the air battle, as described earlier for blue water, will be just as important in the brown. In order to deal with forces that survive our shaping efforts, the Integrated Investment Program is bringing us a series of projects under the Integrated Air and Missile Defence Program. Upgrades to SEM-2 and ESSM missile systems 
and the addition of the long-range SM6 active radar missile will greatly improve the effectiveness of our organic fleet air defence. But in the brown water, the I in integrated air missile defence becomes critical. We will need to employ RAF and deploy Army surveillance systems to compensate for terrain masking of our shipborne sensors. An integrated common operating picture is necessary to make this work properly and the integrated investment program has resource key enablers for this. Rather than leaving individual projects to try to pick it up as they did in the past. The glue for land and maritime efforts in the littoral is amphibious warfare. The integrated investment program provides funding for upgrades to the camp class LHDs and the LSD HMAS chills and replacement amphibious and sea lift vessels and watercraft. Over time, the capability of the Canberra Crafts LHDs will be enhanced to better support joint command and control, including upgrades to communications and intelligence systems and semi-autonomous self-defence capabilities. This will include communication systems that are compatible with all amphibious force elements, watercraft, helicopters and amphibious vehicles. Allowing enhanced command and control and situational awareness, uh, the ships will also be fitted with systems that allow them to collect, analyse and distribute intelligence. In the longer term, the existing landing craft used to transport the people and equipment from the camp class ships to the shore will be replaced with new vessels. Planned investment in CHULs includes updating the ship's battle management and command and control communication and intelligence capabilities to enable it to work effectively with the Canberra class amphibious ships. Fitting self-defence systems for protection against torpedoes, anti-ship missiles and fast attacks, attack craft and fitting aviation support systems where needed. The Integrated Investment Program also provides for the replacement of CHULs around 2030. CHULs has demonstrated the benefits of this type of vessel in extending the reach of the ADF and enhancing our capacity to deploy larger and better equipped forces. One area we've been focusing on is making sure we invest properly in sustainment. We have known for a long time that the return is well worth the investment, but it's not as simple as it sounds and we'll still have work to do in this area. How will we use the channeling effects of hydro hydrography, high maritime density and proximate land to our advantage and to the enemy's disadvantage? How do we ensure in peacetime that we have the hydrographic intelligence we need in war? These factors need to be considered holistically as we develop our concepts for our mine countermeasures and hydrographic platforms and their various subsystems. The traditional Western perception of this is shaped by World War II in Europe in which a continental strategy was necessary. The enemy's centre of gravity was on land and amphibious operations were merely enablers for subsequent decisive action ashore. In our archipelagic geography, focusing on any single landmass invites bypassing by sea. Therefore, I suggest the centre of gravity in an archipelagic campaign is likely to be controlling the medium of manoeuvre, the sea. The role of the amphibious force in project power ashore only when and where it affects sea control. Modern amphibious forces have readily modest land combat power and cannot therefore go head to head against significant enemy land power. Their strength lies in their mobility and agility, not their combat weight. Their objectives must be realistic. They need to isolate targets in time and space and complete the mission before the enemy can make numerical preponderance count. Hence, the threat is manageable within our capability of the force. If we are to exploit manoeuvre rather than mass, it will affect our whole approach to littoral warfare, including hydro hydrography and mine warfare. Manoeuvre is all about avoiding enemy responses by exploiting movement and that is time dependent. Traditional hydrography and mine warfare is far too slow for this. We need to build a geospatial intelligence base before conflict starts. There, where can our deep draft amphibious ships go that submarines can't, for example? What beaches are suitable for landings? What areas are easy or difficult to mine? The temporal demands of manoeuvre are such as to rule out clearing any substantial numbers. The approach to mines is more likely to be identify and avoid rather than clear a way through. This may imply having no surface assault and entirely rotor ring landings. Sure, this limits the combat weight that can be applied, but the whole point of manoeuvre is to attack where you don't need masses of combat power. To return to my starting theme, the best defence against mines is to land where you're not expected and unpredictably depends on having the hydrographic intelligence to allow freedom of manoeuvre. To support this, 
There are no less than eight geospatial projects in the inter integrated investment program. The integrated investment program provides a number of opportunities to develop our geospatial capabilities. The current fleet of two large and four small ADF hydrographic survey vessels will be progressively retired from the early 20s. Navy will replace this capability with an efficient combination of military and commercial hydrographic and oceanographic survey capabilities <coughs> excuse me, to de deliver the required capacity. Subject to de developments in technology, modular systems could in the future enable enhanced hydrographic capabilities from non-specialised vessels suitable for tasks, including rapid environmental assessment in support of operations. The proposed strategic collection vessels and improved data management ca capabilities are required to meet both our national charting and military intelligence needs. The Integrated Investment Program also provides opportunities to develop new capabilities and operating concepts for deployment of autonomous underwater vehicles and more capable sensors technology to detect mines and survey the inshore region ahead of the amphibious force. Navy will extend the life of the four Huon class coastal mine hunters until the 2030s through a service life extension and capable assurance program to be conducted in the early 20s. Extending the life of the Huon class fleet will provide time to develop and evaluate remotely operated mine countermeasures and bathymetric collection systems to inform capability development. This could include the potential future options of modular mine countermeasure systems that could be deployed from a range of vessels. This is, this is the premise for the future OPV, OPV variant to support deployable mine countermeasure tasks and tactical rapid environmental assessment in support of the task group. So to conclude, as the bell rings, perfectly timed, what does all this mean for the future of littoral warfare in practical terms? Firstly, defence needs to prioritise the littoral warfare capability Australia must invest in. There is a finite sum of resources and we need explicit strategic logic for prioritising how it is divided up. The government's white paper and integrated investment program provides us the means. The first principle review and the capability life cycle redesign underpins the decision process we need to make on the path to government approval. Secondly, defence must develop a joint concept of how to fight in the littoral within the resources allocated by the defence white paper. Navy must engage in energetically along with Army to ensure a program approach is taken, and this is happening. Thirdly, we need to future-proof our platforms. What we buy them for now may not be what we want to use them for in the future. This is a recurring lesson of history. Our platforms must be designed to accommodate uncertainty. The Integrated Investment Program provides the opportunity to do this with a stream and program view. Finally, we need to consider the balance between quality and quantity. Manoeuvre tactics demand sufficient units to manoeuvre. Small numbers of super units have a dismal record in war. Again, the Integrated Investment Program provides the opportunity to do this with a stream and program view, and the Capability Lifecycle Redesign provides the means. I'll finish by inviting you to apply your minds uh, to the challenges of littoral warfare and delivery of the future capability that allows us to operate in this environment. I've deliberately not just regurgitated the white paper and IIP as it relates to Navy or the Joint Force, but provide some context to the strategic challenges that drives our capability decision making and organisations like the ANI can, do, can and do have an impact on the way defence think. So to support the good professor, if you want to be heard, get thinking and get involved. On that note, that's my view of the future, if that helps. Two quick questions. Any direction? Yes. Yeah, I think I think it is, and I, as the more we play in the space, like with the new LHDs, you know, they have systems like you know, you know, RO plants and uh, surge systems. I think we're going to get lessons learned, and we're going to build our experience. The other thing is, uh, there's a lot of uh, commercial technology out there which is already dealing with a lot of those type systems, and but I think as you know. IMO standards and national park standards start changing. That's going to put a lot of demand on our resources to keep up with it. So you've got to do a certain amount of future proofing. 
In terms of the weapon technology, sensor technologies, I think there's a number of aspects. Um, the theory of radar is what it's been for you know, mil millions of years and you can't change that. But what we're seeing in some of our technologies like CA radar and, and what we see in the Aegis technologies, they're exploiting the environment and, those tech and the, the, the bounds, the limits of, of some of the science we've got at the moment to try and work that. But you can't just do it with one sensor or one weapon, and that comes back to that integrated uh, approach. And I think where Air Force and Army and Navy are going in that integrated air missile defence is where you have a number of sensors, a number of weapon systems integrated, which allows you to work around the terrain or the environment you're in. The other area, though, where I think we do need to get in a lot of work, I mean, everybody talks about UAVs and how cool they are, and you see it every day on the news, but it's the underwater autonomous vehicles. And there's a lot of work going in the commercial sector and those, and we're actually doing this with one of the um, deployable mine warfare programs and the REA program, where we're using that technology and we're applying commercial technology in a military <coughs> context. So we've got a big journey to do, and we need academia, academia, we need science, we need industry to come together, and we're going to develop a program to do that around those autonomous vehicles to work out over the next 10 years you know, where best to go. Um, so, yeah, I think it is recognised, but it, it requires a whole bunch of smart people um, with a program view of how to, how to get the best out of that. Thank you very much, sir. That's Fine. very good of you. Thank you very much indeed. Thanks, Dave.